giving you a few examples how to manage complex systems based on self-regulation. So there's a problem. Complex systems may be dynamically unstable, and that's why we often find, for example, stop-and-go traffic, as you can see it over here, emerging. There's no traffic light, by the way. There's just a few vehicles dropping in down there that create perturbations, and these perturbations are basically amplified through a cascade effect. And that creates the stop and go traffic. So people get stopped, although nobody wants this to happen. We know the same thing actually from supply chain. So there is this famous beer game. And even if you play that with experienced managers, it turns out they will face big problems to have their stocks on the right level. Either you tend to have too much stocks or you run out of stocks, and this is a typical problem. And in fact, there are models for these kinds of systems, not just for traffic systems. You've probably seen traffic equations a lot of times, so today I'm going to focus on supply chains, and you can come up basically with equations that are taking into account how much inventory is stored, depending on how much products are produced and how much are sold. And if you have this supply chain and a little bit of variability of the customer demand, then it turns out that you can have this bullwhip effect, very much like the stop and go waves that we've seen before. And the question is, is that relevant maybe for our entire economy? Are booms and recessions nothing else than stopping go waves of our economy? So for this we have to be a little bit more sophisticated and take into account that products are flowing in networks. So we have to come up with network models, but that's possible, we've done this. And then it's interesting to do an analysis of the dynamics of these equations. It turns out that you can have a number of different cases. So depending on the so-called input-output matrix, you can either have overdamp behavior. In this case, your system, when driven out of equilibrium, will again go back into the equilibrium. Same thing with damped oscillations. but. Uh, then basically the system will oscillate around the stable state, the equilibrium. But it can also happen actually that you have growing oscillations in the system depending on the network structure of the supply network. And so the question is, what will happen for a realistic supply network of the world? So we've looked into this, there are data, taken the input-output matrices for world production. As you can see, industrial chemicals basically go into agriculture, and that into wood production, and that into construction, or agriculture goes into food production, restaurants, and so on and so on. So here, the supply chains are well mapped out. And now we put this matrix into our dynamical equations, and that's what we get. We find oscillatory behavior, but those oscillations are not periodic, actually, as we find it in reality. There are no periodic booms and recessions. That's something that has puzzled economists for a long time. And to understand deviations from periodic behavior, people have always said, okay, there was a technological a technological shock, so some innovation that has basically mixed up the market and has driven it out of this periodic oscillations. But now we can understand this non-periodicity of the oscillations through the network structure of the supply network. Now the question is, can we dampen out those oscillations? And for this I've looked into different kinds of supply networks, the supply chain, a ladder structure, a hierarchical structure, and here are the three dynamical outcomes. And what you can see is 
while the supply chain produces these terrible large oscillations, the ladder structure that has some redundancy in the way you're delivering your, to your customer is pretty much damping out all the oscillations. So by changing the network structure, you can stabilize the economy. That's my claim. And interestingly enough, this is the supply chain of Intel technologies, and you can see absolutely the same kind of structure. So I don't know how they arrive with this, but apparently there must be a reason that they're using it, and uh, they're doing pretty well, as you know. Um, so now let's go to the next step: how to match complexity in a bottom-up way based on self-organization and distributed control. Now let's go back to vehicles. So, for some years we've been collaborating with Volkswagen on the question, okay, how could we improve traffic flow? And the idea was that cars would basically become more and more intelligent, they would have something like perception by onboard data acquisition, that would be into vehicle communication, and so, together, <coughs> vehicles could figure out what is the traffic situation they are in, we could call that cognition, and then based on that information, cars would take decisions on how to change the driving style in order to improve the traffic flow. Of course, the driver would also be informed. And uh, so, first of all, what this requires the practices to integrate a number of different data sources, so, for example, also the GPS data about the location, because you also need to know where is an on-ramp, where is uh, a building site, and all these kind of things. And um, then, based on this information about the traffic situation that the car is in, uh, you basically do different things. So here are three parameters, acceleration, deceleration, and time gap. And the size of these parameters is changed relative to the normal situation of free traffic in different kinds of situations, such as approaching the upstream end of congestion, driving in congested traffic, driving in a bottleneck section, or at the downstream location, of the congestion, and the particularly important point is that at the end of the congestion, the car has to accelerate quickly, uh, and also uh, it should reduce a little bit the time gap. And in this way, it's possible to stabilize the traffic flow and to increase the capacity, and so we can reduce traffic congestion from this situation towards almost no congestion, even if you have only 20% of vehicles equipped with this kind of technology. So that is quite interesting that we have collective effects also for other cars that are not equipped. And here is a simulation that shows you what's going on. First of all, we're simulating stop and go traffic as we have it today. Yeah, quite annoying, but well familiar to every one of us. This is, by the way, the coffee meter. This is measuring changes in acceleration and thereby kind of the uh, level of discomfort. And now I have a very special car, so you will envy me for it, because I can turn it into a helicopter. And that allows me to see what's the reason for the stop and go traffic. It's actually those cars trying to get into the freeway and producing small perturbation. Those perturbations are amplified because of the instability of traffic flow, and, and that creates stop and go traffic. Now we assume that the cars are equipped with this traffic assistance system. That means every car has a um, radar sensor measuring the distance and relative velocity, and that allows the car to drive automatically in a way better than human drivers can. You can see that now we have free traffic flow even though the inflow into the freeway hasn't changed. So, given that the interactions of cars was a problem for 
congestion. We have to change the interactions in order to come up with a desirable outcome by self-organization. And we call that mechanism design. <clears throat> Can we do the same thing for urban traffic flow? So, the idea we had is, could we come up with adaptive traffic light control that's capable of adapting to complex street networks with traffic disruptions by building sites or accidents and particular events? And today's traffic light control is not that adaptive. So basically it was clear that we would have to start from scratch. Today's approach is based on top-down control. Our idea was, couldn't we use self organization to allow order in the traffic flow to come up and coordination? And for this, first of all, we have uh, to encode the road network into a graph, as you can see over here, so this intersection will be mapped into something like this. It looks already quite complicated, but it can be done in an automatic way today. And uh, then we have to model the dynamics on the road sections, and there are equations for this that just need to know the inflow and the outflow and everything else, including travel times and locations of uh, the end of traffic jams follows from this. Now we have to think about how the flow is basically distributed over the different <coughs> road sections at the intersection. So there is, of course, a flow conservation principle. And uh, in detail, it becomes a bit tricky. So if you have to model diverges and merges, they're kind of um, complicated formula, and one thing that sticks out is the minimum function over here. But that tells you that you can do a lot of things in the wrong way. Because if you operate that system in the wrong way, you will immediately <coughs> lose capacity because the minimum function jumps in. So everything is about avoiding to activate these minimum functions. Of course, you also have uh, to take into account traffic lights, and uh, we do that with a variable permeability factor, which is zero when we have a red light and one if we have a green light. And then the problem is to coordinate different traffic lights, like traffic light one and two. So in the ideal case, cars won't be stopped another time. Uh, we call that a green wave principle. But you can do a lot of things wrong here. So you could have a non-optimal phase shift, different cycle times, or randomness. All of this would basically produce extra waiting times. And it turns out to be very difficult to come up with a coordination of the traffic so how have we done that in the end? I mean, it turns out that we were inspired by pedestrian flows and uh, bottlenecks. Because what happens there is that we find oscillatory flows. And it looks like there was a traffic light for the pedestrians, but there is not. The reason for these oscillatory flows is a pressure principle. And then we said, okay, couldn't we understand traffic flows and intersections also like a generalization of this? So intersections as bottlenecks just for more than two flow directions. Couldn't we use a pressure principle to define self-organized oscillations and by this define the traffic lights? Couldn't we come up with a situation where, in a self-organized way, neighboring intersections would coordinate, and in this way the coordination would spread all over the city eventually, in a bottom-up way. And in fact, uh, you've seen here 
for some time the green waves uh, in this movie. And um, that means that it is possible. Just the question is, how efficient is it really? So for this, let us compare three different kinds of organizing complex systems, in this case a traffic system, such as uh, urban traffic flow scenario. And so the classical approach is top-down regulation. So you have a central traffic control authority that's collecting data from all over the city. It's trying to come up with an optimal control, but it's not possible to do this optimization in real time because the optimization problem is NP-hard. And so what people do is they come up with an offline optimization for a typical scenario, like traffic on Monday mornings between 9 and 10 o'clock. Traffic on Friday afternoon between 4 and 5 o'clock. Traffic before or after a soccer game. It turns out, however, that the variability of traffic flow is so big that there is no typical traffic flow. That means your optimal solution for a typical traffic situation is not the optimal solution for the actual traffic situation. And even though these uh, traffic control schedules are slightly adapted by extending green times and so on, it's still not fully adapted. Now, let's compare that with another scenario where basically intersections in a bottom-up, decentralized way would independently of each other minimize waiting time. And uh, so, that seems to be very plausible, and also mathematically it's feasible. Wouldn't that, if every intersection just does the best thing we can do, wouldn't that produce the perfect traffic flow scenario? And then, the third scenario is the same thing, but you basically pay attention to what happens at neighboring intersections to avoid spillover effects. So let's look at the outcome. Q lengths is shown over the capacity utilization of the intersection. And you can see for the top-down regulation, Q lengths increases with capacity utilization, but that makes a lot of sense. You cannot avoid this to happen. But how do the other control approaches compare with this? Well, for the selfish optimization, so every intersection by itself minimizes the waiting times. You see, oh, queue lengths are much shorter up to this point, where suddenly the queue lengths explode. So what's going on here? Well, basically here, you could say that Adam Smith's invisible hand works. There is a coordination going on by itself in the system. It's much more efficient than the top-down regulation. But then there is a point where this self-organized coordination breaks down and Adam Smith's invisible hand fails. A situation that has also happened in financial markets, basically in 2008. We pushed it so far self organized coordination and growth down. Now, what <coughs> happens with the other regarding approach, which is also bottom-up and decentralized, but pays attention to what happens with your neighbors in neighboring intersections. And indeed, this is better than every other approach. And it's, it, it works actually up to the maximum capacity utilization. So, we can say this decentralized bottom-up principle for flexible and adaptive traffic light control makes the invisible hand work. And we can also say bottom-up self-regulation can outsmart optimal top-down control. This is absolutely important because you wouldn't expect that a decentralized approach would ever be better than a top-down 
optimization approach. This is really changing our entire way of thinking about how to run complex systems. Now, would it work in practice or just in theory? And so let's go into this example. We've looked into this uh, in Dresden where the traffic authority said, okay, here is an area where we are not happy with the traffic plan control we have at the moment. We paid a lot for this, you know, so there was a public competition and the best offer was taken. The best offer actually has a green wave along these roads, so it's really a modern thing. And the green wave is also, or traffic light control is also adaptive, so it's really a state-of-the-art traffic light control, but they wanted to prioritize public transport, and there are so many different lines cutting through this area, which anyway is complex as you can see, a very complex road network in terms of the geometry. Um, and so if you would prioritize public transport, it would interrupt the green waves all the time. And uh, that would mean, you know, the green wave wouldn't work, and uh, so you would get a monster congestion within just a few minutes in the center of city. So they couldn't prioritize trans public transportation. And they said, okay, if you think you're smarter than we, you know, take this problem and show what you can do. Okay, so usually you would say, okay, give us another example to be fair, yeah? But we did it, and it turns out that uh, less congestion on the road, trams go earlier. Uh, of course you can say, okay, this is just a demonstration, and maybe you've just taken this time segment where things look better for you, so okay. We are scientists, we have to look into the statistics, right? And so let's compare the way traffic is organized between state-of-the-art control, so you can clearly see the green wave, so basically the first traffic light collects a lot of vehicles, and when there are enough vehicles, all of them get this green wave. It creates large bands of green waves. Well, here you can see there's also a green wave principle, but you don't have these large bands. And there's more flexibility. So basically, rather than producing a green wave, we let it happen by using gaps in the traffic flows as opportunities, which makes the whole thing more flexible. And so this is what came out. Public transport at a much the traumatic reduction in the delay times. So we could prioritize public transport, but not at the cost of motorized traffic, they even had a slight improvement. So that's really astonishing. And also pedestrian and cyclists have an improvement. And above all, it's also good for our environment. So it's really much better than what we used to do. Now the question is, can we apply this basically to everything? All the complex systems that bother us in the world and that, where we had problems to come up with good solutions. So look into the production network issue. In fact, we can compare production networks with road networks in many ways. So road sections correspond to buffers, travel delay times to cycle times, congestion appears to full buffers. Then, um, junctions correspond to processing units, and so on, and so on, and so on, and accidents to machine breakdowns. So there are many analogies, but the problem is more difficult because you have potentially many different kinds of products that you want to produce by just one factory. Anyway, so let's see what we can do, and this is how the representation of a packaging plant looks like. So there are different parts of the production. It all starts with a corrugator that produces paper. And then afterwards you have to do something with the paper and you want maybe to come up with 
special kinds of boxes or packaging materials of all sorts of kinds. And so you, you need to have some post-processing. And the problem is that you have to meet all sorts of schedules and uh, your buffers might be full and so basically you have to cycle the materials in, in order to get to the materials that need to be processed next and so on. And in fact, these things happen in the production process, so in many cases there's not as much productivity as we'd like to have. And the question is, why is this happening and how to avoid this? And it turns out that basically perturbations in production logistics propagate like traffic jams. So a bottleneck may develop, and as a result, jams propagate upstream, and missing quantities go downstream. So we could come up with actually something like a traffic flow model for production systems, but it looks more complicated than a classical uh, traffic flow model. And uh, first thing, of course, is you have to abstract your production plant in a way that can be represented mathematically. And for this, you need to have an accurate representation. So there are different steps here to abstract the system until you end up with a network graph. And then the next thing is that you have to define operations at the nodes and on the links. So we have basically specified an agent-based model and we have actually created a factory simulator and moreover we have done it in a way uh, that explores the possibility of self-organized production. So the idea is that all the products basically have an RFID chip or anything that has information on it and it could, in this way, communicate with the machines producing certain things in the factory. It could, they could also talk to the other packets or units. So, there can be communication, and you could say, okay, I want to be processed, and I have to be finished by 3.20 today. Yeah? And then you communicate with these other units, and basically that triggers a series of events and some processing that uh, finally, hopefully, creates an efficient way of production. So these are the different steps that you have to consider. So first enter the system, then you have to form the destination that you're on the way. The destination has to say, okay, you have to be finished by this time. And then there is a pass finding that is required and uh, maybe some cycling is involved, that means uh, circulation of units in order to make space. When you have to calculate uh, the transportation time to the destination, you have to trigger movements and transfers uh, through the transfer car. Uh, there <coughs> needs to be a selection of the next lane to avoid hindrances and relocations that might be needed, and then eventually you will exit the system. Yeah, so here is just an illustration of the detail of all this. So basically this box says, okay, I'm in a hurry, I need to be processed, you know, so talks to this unit, this is transferred to over there and to, to there, and basically then uh, the machines producing the next processing step um, are informed and something happens, okay? Same thing with the routing, so there are different possibilities and sometimes the shorter route is actually the best choice, uh, but not always, or it could be that you need to take a detour to overtake. And here is just an illustration of uh, self-organization and such systems could work, so you can see that there are many units that have to be delivered to all sorts of destinations and when there is a little capacity utilization and every box takes the shortest path, if there is large capacity utilization you see that there is an emergence of a circular flow. 
and you don't take the shortest paths anymore. So that means these systems have self-organizing capacity. They'll figure out what is the way that works well. And in the end, actually, we could use that also to change in an evolutionary way the layout of the packaging plant, because this company had problems with at least one of their plants and produced a lot of congestion, and that's why they couldn't operate in a profitable way. So they were asking, how could we kind of rebuild our plan to be more profitable? And that really depends on the flexibility of the system. So we have run basically an evolutionary algorithm on top of it. And for, for each of the layouts of this factory, as we have this agent-based approach, we'll have an automatic specification of a production dynamic. So you don't have basically to define line by line what, what each of these uh, different uh, machines is doing in what order and what other machines it's communicating with because all these elements could be just put together and as they're just in interacting with their neighbors we don't need to have a definition of the global layout. Everything now happens in a self-organized way. So, that happened in 2008, and uh, I think it was a really revolutionary approach, and we see just today how, how visionary that was. <laughs>